We often neglect our routers. Most of us use the one that we get from our internet service provider or an average consumer grade router. We plug it in and then we never look at it again for years, except to occasionally reboot it when our internet stops working. Hi, I'm your router. Oh, hi router, I don't see you much. Yeah, I know. It's kind of an issue. Why does everyone always forget about me? The router is the gateway between your devices and the internet at large. If it's compromised, it's like leaving the front door to your home network wide open, allowing malicious actors to enter. If you don't pay attention to your router, it can create a serious hole in your security and privacy. So we're putting together a series of videos that talk about home networks and how to make them safer. This first video is about how to give your hardware and software a major overview. Overhaul. We'll discuss the four different technologies that are actually inside one of these boxes that we generally think of as just a router. We'll talk about the major security weaknesses of these devices. And finally, we'll walk you through a step-by-step -step tutorial of how to upgrade your setup. So what's actually in one of these boxes? You're buying four technologies. They're in one package. There's a switch. There's a router, there's a firewall, and there's an access point. Brent Cowling is the founder of Protectly and an expert in securing home networks. And he explained to me the role that each of these four technologies plays in your home network. First, the switch. It's made to allow very fast, very efficient communication between devices on the same network. So you might have a printer, a couple of computers, a storage system, all on your local network. They most efficiently talk to one another through a switch. It's like an internal postman that delivers packages just inside an apartment building. What if one of these devices wants to connect with something outside of their local network, like the internet? You don't want all of your private devices to just be sitting out on the public internet. So you use a router. That's the second technology in this box. You can think of the router like a doorman that your devices have to go through to connect to the broader internet and that the internet has to go through to get to your local devices. The router has a public facing IP address, which you could think of like a street number for a building that lets internet traffic know where to reach you. And the router assigns the devices on your local network a private IP address, which you can think of like an apartment number inside the building. It looks something like this and usually starts with 192.168. The router receives traffic from the internet and routes it to the right place on your local network. And it takes traffic from your local devices and sends it out to the broader internet through the public IP address. Now there's certain traffic that you don't necessarily want coming into your private network. So that's why we have a firewall, which is the third technology in this box. What a firewall does is it is the barrier that is keeping the public internet out and your private network in. You can think of it like a bouncer at the building. It's going to let traffic out depending on the rules of your firewall and it's going to block unsolicited traffic from coming in but allow traffic that you've requested to come in. The internet can be a pretty hostile place so your firewall is an important layer of protection that hides devices on your private network away from these bad actors. And finally in a router box you have a wireless access point. Basically, it's what allows you to create a Wi-Fi network so that your devices can connect to each other and to your router wirelessly. It turns out that the security of these four-in-one consumer-grade devices is pretty bad for two big reasons, cost and ease of use. Because they're trying to sell as many of those things as possible, they make them as cheap as possible, which means they put as little effort as possible into security and they try to make it as easy to use as possible, which means usually they remove as much security as possible because security is hard. You definitely don't want to skimp on security when it comes to the gateway between the hostile internet and your computer. And yet there are countless software and firmware security weaknesses in one of these typical routers. Usually these things are deployed by the thousands from uh, some distribution center uh, and they might have firmware on them that's months if not years old that has proven to be vulnerable. Router vendors usually don't bother patching these devices despite being aware of critical vulnerabilities. In a 2020 report, nearly all of the routers they tested had security flaws and some were very severe. These included outdated versions of Linux, software with known vulnerabilities, or even hard-coded credentials like admin passwords coded directly into the firmware that were accessible to hackers. If the firewall is no longer able to block unsolicited traffic from coming into your network. If there's a vulnerability that exists and outside actors are able to gain access to that device, that's a particularly dangerous thing. 
because that means that they can see all the traffic that goes through that device and they can then get access to all the devices that are on your private network. There's also been a rise in the number of router vulnerabilities in recent years, with one report saying that more than half of the vulnerabilities discovered were high priority and 18% were critical. Hackers are well aware of these router vulnerabilities and find them by constantly scanning all ports and public IP addresses looking for them. Hackers are absolutely automating the scouring. It is prevalent, it's widespread, it happens every single day. It's targeting everyone indiscriminately. So it's something we all need to protect ourselves against. They might be trying to gain access to your home network so they can exploit whatever data they can find on your home network. Or more often, they're trying to gain access to your device to add it to a botnet so that they can monetize a botnet to launch denial of service attacks on various other devices on the internet. And often they're doing both these things. This is a, a very persistent threat and something that people should be aware of. It's not personal though, it's just the nature of the internet. So what can you do? You want to be very careful about keeping your firewall up to date and you want to be aware of what's happening at that barrier between your home network and the internet. Our primary focus in this video is to give you a much more secure router setup. We'll take your existing router and change the settings to disable most of its functionality. Then we're going to add a new device called a Protectly Vault that runs much better software and firmware to handle your router functionality and your firewall. If you upgrade your home network by making these changes, you're augmenting what your ISP has provided and you're stepping up your level of security significantly. This new Protectly Vault will have three upgraded components. First, the software that we'll use to run our new router and firewall. We're going to use software called PFSense, which is open source and will give us more control over what our firewall is doing and allow all kinds of things that just weren't possible with our existing software. Then there's the firmware, which is the code that sits between the hardware and the operating system and allows them to interface with each other. Most firmware is opaque, so you can't tell what it's really doing and is also notoriously buggy. If a hacker can compromise this in your router and firewall, it puts all the devices on your network at risk. We're going to use firmware called Coreboot, which is open source and maximizes security, transparency, and auditability of this code. Finally, you can't just put Coreboot on any hardware. You need hardware that's been specifically designed to be compatible with Coreboot. We're going to use the Protectly hardware, where Brent is the CEO. We first heard about Protectly from privacy and security expert Michael Basil, and his book, Extreme Privacy is linked in the video description for anyone interested. First, choose the Protectly Vault that you'd prefer. Ours is a four-port device with 8 gigabytes of memory and 120 gigabytes of SSD storage, but 4 gigabytes RAM and 32 gigabytes SSD are more than enough to run PFSense. You can determine which specs are right for you. We got one without a Wi-Fi card, and we'll explain why in a moment. And we ordered ours with Coreboot pre-installed on it. Now let's install PFSense onto our Protectly Vault. Take a blank USB thumb drive and have a monitor and keyboard ready. Go to pfsense.org slash download. From the drop-down menus, select AMD64 for architecture, which is the processor that Protectly uses. For installer, select USB. For console, select VGA. And for mirror, select the location closest to you, then click download and save the image somewhere on your computer hard drive. Now go to balena.io slash etcher and download the software onto your computer. Open it, select flash from file, and choose the disk image you just downloaded. Under target, choose your USB stick. Click Flash. Once the flash is complete, remove the thumb drive. Now take your Protectly Vault, make sure it's powered down, and plug in a keyboard and monitor to it. Insert your USB stick to the Protectly, and then turn the Protectly Vault on. It should boot the PFSense installer automatically, but if it doesn't, while it's powering up, press F11, which should show you the boot options, and you can select Boot from USB. Press Enter to install PFSense, enter for default key map, enter for auto ZFS, enter to install, enter for Stripe, enter to select the Protectly device for where to install the image, and the letter Y to confirm your choice one last time. Once the install is complete, select No when asked to make changes. And finally, press R to restart the device. 
Once that's rebooted, you can remove the thumb drive, the monitor, and the keyboard. Now we're going to configure our PFSense settings. Plug an Ethernet cable into the LAN port of your ProtectLe Volt and plug the other end into your computer. Open a browser on your computer and go to 192.168.1.1 and you'll come to a PFSense login page. Your default username is probably admin and your default password is probably PFSense. Oh, hi computer. Just popping in with a quick tip, you'll want to change that default password at some stage. Ooh, noted. Now this is the default URL that you currently go to in order to access your router and firewall settings. We're going to change it to something else. You're adding a little obscurity to your network, right, by not using the defaults, which is always good. Select interfaces, LAN, and then scroll down to where it says static IPv4 configuration. Delete what's there and add in some other arbitrary number in the 192.168 space. For the purposes of this video, we've chosen 137 for our third octet. You could just as easily choose 143 or 216 or any preferred number. So for example, you'll type into the IPv4 address 192.168.137.1. This new static IP address is going to be where you'll be able to access your PFSense settings going forward when connected to your local network. Click save, but don't apply it yet. Because that's going to instantly change the IP address of the interface, and then you're not going to be able to reach the web browser anymore. Now we're going to change the DHCP server range. DHCP is the service that hands out IP addresses on your network. There are over 65,000 private IP addresses that DHCP can choose from when handing out addresses to your devices. And they're usually numbers between 192.168.1.1 to 192.168.255.254. We're gonna decrease the range of numbers that DHCP server is allowed to use. Go to services and select DHCP server. Again, we're keeping it in the 137 space for our third octet. Under from, write 192.168.137. Pick it 100. And then under two, write 192.168.137.254. So our new range for the fourth octet is from dot 100 to dot 254. 254 is the highest number that you're allowed to assign. Why did we choose 100 as the lower bound? It's kind of a personal preference thing. I like to save a number of addresses at the lower end of the range for setting up static devices. For example, we assigned the vault itself the static IP address of 192.168.137.1. And in a moment, we're going to assign another static IP address to our wireless access point. So we've saved all the numbers lower than 100 in the 137 space for such static addresses. And when DHCP hands out temporary IP addresses, it's now allowed to only use numbers 100 and higher in this space. Now, there are only 154 possible IP addresses to choose from, which is plenty for most households. If you're thoroughly confused and want to understand how IP addresses work and what all these numbers mean, we highly recommend Network Chuck series on IP addresses, which we've linked in our description. Save out and your changes will be automatically applied. Go back to Interfaces and LAN, and now you can apply your static IP changes. Your web page might seem unresponsive, but what's actually happened is you've changed the location of the PFSense settings, and your computer can't connect Anymore. What you will need to do is physically unplug your laptop from that connection and plug it back in so that your laptop uh, goes, uh oh, I don't have a DHCP address anymore. I need to ask the network for one and it will get an address that's in the correct range now. Now go to Terminal or System Preferences to check the new IP address that your computer's been assigned. If your DHCP range change has been successful, the ProtectLe Vault is now handing out addresses in the 137 space. You should also now be able to find the PFSense settings at 192.168.137.1. You can now unplug your ProtectLe Vault from your computer and plug the vault instead into your network setup. But an important tip if you ever need to unplug power from your ProtectLe Vault. When you unplug the vault, did you shut it down or did you just unplug it? <laughs> Don't be like Naomi. You definitely want to go through the shutdown process on that because it's an operating system. It's like Windows. If you just pull the plug, there's a good chance that at some point it will get corrupted. Now let's look at your existing network setup and understand how the ProtectLe Vault fits in. When you call your internet service provider, they come out, they hook up internet. And what that means is they bring in a fiber or a coax or a DSL line into your house, usually there's some sort of media conversion that needs to happen between the wire that physically enters your house 
and your home network. To do this media conversion, you need a modem. That's often a separate device from the four-in-one router, switch, firewall, and access point device that we talked about at the start. The modem transforms the analog signals from the internet cable installed by your ISP into digital information that your computer can understand, and vice versa. A modem box usually has just two ports, something like a coaxial cable input and an RJ45 input for an ethernet cable. We're gonna keep using our existing modem in our new setup. It is possible that you have a single five-in-one router and modem combined device. That's a little more tricky to repurpose for your new setup, and it requires that you put it into something called bridge mode. By putting your existing modem into bridge mode, you're disabling all those other things and you're just passing raw internet through the ISP modem onto your vault. We're not gonna dive into bridge mode in this video. But if the modem is just simply a coaxial connection and an RJ45 ethernet connection on it and that's it, then it's already just passing raw internet through that RJ45 port. We're gonna take that separate device and use it in our new setup as is. Unplug your existing four-in-one router device from the modem and connect the WAN port on your Protectly device to the modem using an ethernet cable. Pull the power on your modem and plug it back in to kind of reset things. After you've power cycled the modem, plug in the power to your vault and boot that up. Then hopefully the modem will have forgotten what it used to be connected to and it's able to talk with the vault and you'll get an IP address. The final step to our setup is to add Wi-Fi capabilities. For a Protectly Vault, you can get a vault that has a Wi-Fi card in it, um, or you can get a vault that you choose to not put the Wi-Fi card in. We chose a Protectly Vault without Wi-Fi capabilities and are opting to use a separate device for our Wi-Fi access point instead for a couple of reasons. First, the open source software that we're running, PFSense, is based on software called FreeBSD. And FreeBSD does not do wireless very well. The second reason for using a separate Wi-Fi access point is that by segmenting that out into some separate hardware, it gives you more control. Some people want to separate it out because they want to be able to physically unplug the Wi-Fi and know that it's not on. For our Wi-Fi access point, we're going to repurpose our four-in-one router. And to do this, we'll need to put the device into something called AP mode first. This stands for access point mode, and it's where you disable all the functionality of the former router apart from the Wi-Fi access point. To do this, connect one of the ports of your four-in-one device to your computer using an ethernet cable. In your browser, go to 192.168. 8.1.1 to get to the router settings. Each router settings console is going to be slightly different. For my router, I went to Advanced Setup, Wireless AP, and then I clicked Enable AP. I also selected Enable Fixed IP Settings. And for the IP address, I entered 192.168.137.2. That's going to be the address where I'll be able to find my access point settings going forward. For the subnet mask, I wrote 255.255.255.0 to match what we set in PFSense. For gateway IP address, I wrote 1 192.168.137.1 and for primary DNS I also wrote 192.168.137.1. Once you click apply the browser will no longer be connected to your access point because we just changed the IP address where we can access the settings. You might see a progress bar but it's just for show to estimate how much time it's going to take for your access point to reboot. To actually check if the process is completed unplug the network cable from your laptop and then plug it back in and let's make sure that your computer does not get an IP address. If it doesn't, that would mean to me that AP mode is being applied correctly because it should no longer be handing out IP addresses. If you're on a Mac, you might get an IP address that begins with 169.254. That's an address that your computer self assigned because it didn't get one anywhere else. So that also means AP mode was applied correctly. So how do the modem, Protectly Vault, and AP all connect together? I set everything up as follows. Out of the wall, you have your coaxial cable going into your modem. Then the Ethernet RJ45 port on the modem is going into the WAN of the Protectly Vault. Out of the LAN on the Protectly Vault, I have an Ethernet cable into a switch. I like to add a managed switch into the mix because I need a lot of Ethernet ports for hardwired devices. All of your devices that belong on the same network that should talk to each other should all be on the same switch. I plug the AP into the switch also. Once your devices are, are plugged in behind a Protectly Vault, you are now protected from all the things that are on the other side of that Protectly Vault. So now it's time to start exploring things with PFSense. And that's what we're going to do in our upcoming videos. PFSense will give you the ability uh, to turn every single one of what we call the nerd knobs. You can get as granular as you want with tweaking your network 
to do exactly what you want. We'll show you how to segment your network to isolate untrusted devices like TVs and smart devices. These are the kinds of things that have telemetry that run on them. They listen to you. You generally don't want them on your private network. We'll also show you how to configure firewalls to not only block malicious traffic coming into your network, but also block telemetry and data being sent out about your activities. And we'll dive into whole network VPNs. By implementing that kind of advanced security, you're adding additional security to your network to prevent some of the more advanced attacks. And those are the kind of things that you just don't get on those consumer routers or the things that come from your ISP. Taking control of your router and firewall setup is just one of the many things that you can do to reclaim some of your privacy in the digital age. As always, this episode wasn't sponsored by anyone. We don't actually accept show sponsors so that we can make sure that we're being as honest in our reviews as possible. Instead, we're a nonprofit funded entirely by community donations. If you'd like to support our free educational content about being a sovereign individual, head to nbtv.media slash support. All donations are tax deductible in the US, but you can donate no matter where you are. You can also check out our store that sells cool apparel like this to support us. Or even just liking, sharing, subscribing to, and commenting on our content is also really helpful. Thank you for watching, and hopefully these videos help you live a modern, privacy-conscious lifestyle.